Go ahead and start because I know some of you have a class right after this. Um, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, Professor Gul Aga from a faculty member at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign uh, to give us the first uh, distinct, CS Distinguished Lecture for 2020. Um, Gul is a very long time collaborator. Actually, I got to Illinois in 1989, many years ago, and Gul got there, and he's as a faculty and me as a, my first year as a graduate student, and it turns out that uh, eventually Gul was my advisor for my PhD, so it's really nice to see him again after um, maybe a bit of a break, but we've been seeing each other. So Gul is a very well-known name in distributed computing, formal methods, software engineering, and what he is very well known for is something that many of you use, maybe without knowing it, uh, every day, um, is for the actor model, is the model of concurrent object-oriented programming. And um, over the years, uh, you know, the actor model has found its way um, as a model of distributed systems and active distributed systems into programming languages such as Scala and Akka and Erlang and Orleans. And these are systems that are used today by Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter, and these are systems that many of you use every day. So um, what Gul will tell us about is how the, the evolution of this model and how it sort of influenced um, the design of scalable programming systems and how it continues to influence that. Gul is also very well known for his work in formal methods and software testing, in particular, concolic testing, which uh, most recently uh, we received the SIGSOFT Impact Award um, uh, this year, I think, and um, this is, um, you know, the, the need for statistical model checking and formal methods have been applied to not just software testing of very large-scale software systems, but also for biological systems and cyber-physical systems, so um, Gul, in that vein, Gul happens to be the CEO of a company called Embedder Technologies, which looks at uh, structural health monitoring with sensor networks using programming models uh, from the actor uh, paradigm. And um, Gul is a fellow of the, I, I don't want to list all the awards, uh, he's a fellow of the ACM of the IEEE, and um, he's also uh, been the editor-in-chief of IEEE Concurrency, he's been the editor-in-chief of ACM Computing Surveys, and uh, very welcome to, uh, very happy to have Gul here. Uh, welcome, Gul. And then, of course, the biggest part of my career is students that graduated with me, and I'm proud to say Nalini was one of my first and the best. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's get started. I'm going to give you sort of an overview of the uh, the field of programming at, at scale and uh, interactions and reasoning about interactions and scaling up that and some ideas on where the future lies, where it might go, go from here, or at least where part of the future lies, because there is obviously the, uh, uh, the issue of um, quantum computing and things of that nature, which are going to impact things. Thank you. Okay. Let's see if this uh, works. Yeah. So let me start with a motivating example. So Nandini said, oh, I should say something about the, uh, uh, the company that I'm working, startup that I started that I'm working with these days. So maybe use that as a motivating example. And I'll give you something about actor model and some issues in coordination, and then a few techniques about reasoning. And I'll give you a high level view of uh, some of the methods that we've developed before. At least one slide on including on future research. So let's consider an application. Um, so we've basically got this idea of sensor clouds and how we can improve uh, the I o using IoT, improve transportation systems and improve safety. And one of the issues that we are facing is in this country the infrastructure is aging. It was all built after World War II. 70,000 bridges in the U.S. are structurally deficient. A few of them have collapsed. Yeah. So the question is, can we sort of monitor the infrastructure and pinpoint deficiencies? So what they do today is uh, go and inspect these um, every, um, every couple of years. And they, uh, these are visual inspections, and they cost several billion dollars 
uh, total to, uh, to do this, ranging from a few hundred thousand for a small bridge to millions for a large bridge. Half of the investment in infrastructure is in bridges, by the way, uh, because every overpass and so on, that's the expensive part. So the, uh, the, the question is, well, they miss things that are awkward and that may be hidden damage. And uh, if you take two inspectors, they agree only 50% of the time. Moreover, um, between those two years, if something goes wrong, then you don't know. So can we sort of continuously monitor it? And then we've had some research project also in uh, tying it with control systems to, in fact, dampen the vibration and reduce potential damage. So this is sort of uh, the idea that we need scalable cyber physical systems. So here's an example of a bridge that we instrumented, and we put um, sensors on every single cable. It's a cable state bridge on uh, the, to the Jindo Island from the mainland of Korea. Uh, so you literally put about 700 sens uh, sensors, 113 nodes, and this was operating continuously, getting the vibrations. And in fact, we got lucky, and there was a hurricane during this time, and we were able to record uh, the, the exact behavior of the bridge during the hurricane and say that it's, uh, it's safe and so on. Um, got a lot of publicity in the New York Times and uh, The Economist and so on. The fact that uh, what they were really impressed with is was the simplest part of it, which was the bridge calling us in Illinois to say that there was a problem. <laughs> which, of course, was the simplest computer science piece of it uh, compared to the energy management, the distributed computing, the edge computing, the networking protocols, all of that stuff went beyond the reporter's uh, head, but he was really impressed that they can send us an email or a notification <laughs> on our cell phone. Anyway, so uh, this is an example of hundreds of nodes, lots of uh, um, processing, no shared memory, and uh, you know, and you might, of course, have communication faults, node failures, and so on, and they're affecting your variables. These are aspects that we've worked on that I won't talk about today, other than a little bit about formal methods that this is uh, actually more directly inspired. So this work, the interest in this work was inspired by the first two characteristics, which are characteristics of the ACTA model, which I'll briefly describe. And then some of the work in formal methods has been inspired, uh, the statistical model checking, and uh, in fact, the notion of state coming directly from quantum computing, which I was uh, trying to play with at the same time 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, and I'll briefly mention that. So it sort of goes in both directions. So what is uh, the actual model of computation? Well, you're familiar with some models like Turing machines. In case of concurrency, discrete event systems, Markov processes, Petri-Nets is one of the oldest models, uh, Milner's communicating system, calculus of communicating systems. In very practical uh, models, threads and shared machines, which are vaguely uh, in, analogous to the PRAM kind of formal model that people were using. And there's actors which have become big. So what is the actor model? Well. So the actor model is something that's actually now in widespread use. So, um, so for example, uh, uh, Alex Payne, who was the primary architect of uh, Twitter, said that the, the reason that they use Scala is because um, it's in the context of concurrency. Scala has an actor <coughs> library, and that is commonly used to solve concurrency problems. It makes things a lot easier to solve. So that's why they use Scala, because they could use actors. Uh, Facebook engineering said the actor model has really worked well for us. So when you need sort of, sort of billions of users, literally, uh, the, the only way to organize this is in terms of the actor model with, with the formalism. So it's scalability. I mean, the example we had was hundreds of sensors until you sort of put it in a larger scale to, uh, you know, situational awareness or something of that sort with hundreds of bridges after an earthquake, uh, that would, would still be scalable. So the actor model provides scalability. <coughs> so even though they were fans of things like C++ or Java, they said we wouldn't have been able to pull this off in C++ or Java. So the, that, you know, they, they personally like Haskell, uh, um, and they're fans of Python, but the bottom line is that these general purpose languages were not designed with the actor's model at heart. So here's just some examples that they've been used, so they're very familiar. 
So this uh, has, has had now thousands of applications all over. Uh, the one thing I'm glad about with this is that uh, I no longer get asked, which I used to get asked after my thesis in 85 for the next 15 years, but is this practical? <laughs> so, so what is the actor model? The actor model uh, computation is broken into small autonomous pieces or concurrent agents, which are called actors. Actors, as I said, do not share state. Each actor operates asynchronously. So uh, you can think of them as virtual processors on, on different machines. They could be acting at the same time, um, but the rates are not, are not determined. Now you could sort of refine that model for real-time systems and say something about the rates at which they're operating. <coughs> And some of Nalini's work was in that vein, and Shantan Ren, and other of my students, who's visiting from San Diego, joined here. I don't know actually where she is, but there she is, yeah. So she worked on that, that issue. So you can sort of refine this model further, but the basic model is this asynchronous operation. An actor reacts to messages, and it can change its local state, so it's, it's not a functional unit, it can have history. It can send more messages. That's uh, the basic way of interacting. By default, again, these messages are asynchronous, but obviously you can have protocols on top of that, and you can create new actors. That's the actually cover of my book, um, which might have sold more copies than the inside. It's also my only connection to Hollywood. <laughs> the cover was done by, well, used to be my only connection to Hollywood. Now <coughs> I have a daughter who lives there and is a documentarian. Um, the cover was done by a guy named Craig Reynolds in an actor language. He did the, uh, this is before your time, but if you are sci-fi buffs, he did the animation for the motion picture Tron, also in an actor language. So I asked him if I could get an uh, image for my uh, cover of the book, and he said, well, that uh, copyright is with Disney and a small company, and you know Disney will have no interest, I won't be able to convince them. So he suggested this fractal image, which, which I used, and uh, uh, Craig Reynolds got the first Academy Award, for Com Lifetime Achievement Award for computer animation <coughs> some years ago when they started that award. Anyway, so that's my connection to Hollywood and real actors. That's only as close as I get. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, so basically, this, this actor model, and I won't get into the formalism, uh, but the, the intuition you can easily see, you send a message, and eventually it gets to the target actor. So you specify a recipient, and eventually it gets there. And then there are issues of fairness and reasoning, and what, what is a specification, and how things meet specification. The big difference from sequential computing is that the arrival order of these messages is going to be non-deterministic. So you send a message, you don't know exactly when it gets there. Moreover, if two, two actors send a message to a given actor, these messages will be shuffled. They, they will arrive in some order, which is non-deterministic. And when you have an open system, you cannot determine that order. And state actually is intrinsic because, uh, for example, if you're a bank account, and you have a shared account, the balance is going to get depleted with one withdrawal. So you cannot have a functional unit there, you cannot sort of model it as a function. Similarly, uh, if uh, you have an airline reservation system, there's an airline seat, the seat will be to one of these two people clicking. And there's a real change in the world. Now state and sequential programs is just a kind of a shorthand quotation, if you will. All sequential programs are functions, because Turing machines are equivalent to the lambda calculus. They're really functions, and the, and the state is used as an optimization, as a shorthand for not having to deal with the entire continuation, for example, or to pass it as an argument. In case of concurrency, um, state is intrinsic. You cannot get rid of the state, because to get rid of the state, you'd have to know the order of arrival of these messages. You wouldn't need to return the state from the agent, and uh, it just would be impossible in an open world. So it becomes quite intrinsic. Now, uh, this non-determinism leads to a uh, partial order, and that partial order is 
basically is, is very simple to explain. There, there's an arrival order of events on, on each actor, which are the messages coming in. And then, of course, it, it does some actions, which could be atomic in, in your um, uh, semantics, in a, in a big step semantics, which is one of the advantages of the model. And, uh, and there is, of course, when you send a message, it's eventually received. There's a causal connection between these two. So th that's uh, part of the ordering. So you get a partial order when you combine the transitive closure of all the arrival orders and the activation order. So this represents the causality in your computation. And it leads to an exponential uh, buildup in, in, because of the non-determinism. Some of these executions can be problematic. So building up from the small, if you have actors and you compose them, there's a question of sort of the interaction protocol. So let me give you a simple example um, in a minute. And what we're going to be after is, is that the, uh, the software is always error prone in the real world. Lots of bugs and complexity. So how do we address this complexity? And how bad is the problem? So for, for example, software testing accounts for more than 50% of the development costs. Some estimates are as high as 70 to 80 percent. Testing is insufficient. Um, just a recent analysis of so this recent 2018 from 314 companies alone, um, failures affected 3.6 billion people <coughs> and caused 1.7 trillion in financial losses. This is just from 314 companies. So the scale of the problem is huge. Software is buggy, lives depend on it, not just the Boeing software. Uh, you have um, uh, you, you have huge issues. A lot of these problems have to do with concurrency. Whether it's an airplane and you've got uh, the pilot doing things and the computer doing things and controlling the wings and controlling uh, the, the, the flaps on the two wings, you, you've got concurrency, whether it's in the small or in the large, in the large banking system, financial system. So there's sort of the issues of sort of what is the arrival order. What, so even though your programming often fix fixates on bugs that are like, you know, division by zero and small bugs. The problems really come from interactions in these large scale interactions that we scale up. So I'm uh, going to s uh, start with sort of uh, the starting point of the argument then is that we need richer programming languages and specification methods, better ways of understanding what's going on and better ways of reasoning about concurrency in these large scale systems. So what I'll do for the rest of the 40 minutes, some uh, 35 minutes or whatever, is to give you a glimpse of some of these methods and how they're applied and where they've gone. Um, and of course, the premise is that concurrency is a major source of these bugs um, in these systems. So for reasoning about concurrency, we've developed methods, so extended concolic testing with partial order reductions, for example, we work with computational learning algorithms or algorithmic learning for verification, uh, which has some interesting applications. So it was the first paper on that was, was done uh, by my group in uh, collaboration with Mahesh Shmathan. Euclidean model checking, which I won't get into, which um, uh, gets at uh, probability distributions and evolution of probability distributions. Uh, so that's something we develop. And it's been applied at uh, Caltech by, in, in the aeronautics uh, by Murray um, uh, to linear control. Actually, we did the first paper on that too, but to synthesizing linear controllers. What I'll talk about today is on, on this side uh, about concurrency structures. So I'll, I'll discuss synchronized notions of synchronization and sessions and uh, inferring program understanding. And then runtime verification, when you cannot sort of formally verify, what can you do at runtime? And there I'll talk about predictive monitoring, and then statistical model checking. So I'll give you an idea of, of stuff on the right-hand side of this. Okay. All right, so let's start with uh, the problem of coordination. So as I mentioned now, uh, just imagine you have many agents, and they are uh, collaborating on things. Then there is a notion of you know, is this system um, having the right kind of, uh, are, are both of these agents or both of these actors adhering to the same protocol? 
uh, is the system going to make progress? Is, is there going to be deadlock, right? So uh, are actors producing the messages the other actors expect? And so on. Are the messages uh, going to be in an acceptable order? So let me give you a very simple example. Uh, suppose we have a buffer. So you can do a put on this buffer, and the consumer does gets from this buffer, like a print spooler or something, right? So you may be buffering jobs. Now this buffer could be bounded, so that means that uh, uh, you cannot just keep doing puts. At some point the buffer could be full. And you cannot just keep doing gets if the buffer is empty. So what do we do if it's a sequential program? We test and say, uh, is this empty? Not empty, then we can take something and we won't have an error. In the world of concurrency, this is no longer true. Because I could ask the buffer, are you empty? The buffer says no. Somebody puts something in. Or you, I ask the buffer, are you full? And then somebody else puts something in because they ask the same question. And now I try to put it and I have an error. So uh, then I have to step back and do some kind of a protocol to ensure that this doesn't happen or decide how to sort of respond to this issue. So what happens is, uh, in this case, you know, you, you have the size and you could say, okay, well, this is a kind of an automata, and then this has a kind of protocol, this size uh, is greater than zero, less than n, this is a constraint, and this type is evolving. So the type is, is a process type where you're sort of counting the number of puts and the number of gets, and they have a certain constraint between them. So this would be the bounded buffer. Now, when we go to implement it, this could be quite complicated. You have your, your constraints, you have your controller, in come the messages, and then you say, okay, the message came in, and I'm going to uh, look at the mess oldest message in my queue, check my constraints, and I cannot do anything with it now because my buffer is, uh, uh, is let's say, empty, so I put it into my queue. Right? So if I'm going to defer it, I put it into my queue. Right? So now, in this case, what I have to do then is all this complex handling within the actor for messages that are coming in, which of course creates the possibility of errors in my protocol, and if I go to a different context, then I need a different protocol. So data abstractions are quite useful, and local synchronization constraints is a very simple example of this kind of um, abstraction. So instead, I will just constrain the order of processing these messages. So for all sending actors, I can co make a constraint. You could have a disabling condition that says, OK, if, if the buffer is full, I won't accept this kind of a message, or I will defer this kind of a message. So you could have a delay semantics. You say, OK, I'm going to delay. Uh, if somebody does a get, I'm going to delay that message, because I know something will be coming. If I'm a spooler, a printer is not free. I know that printer will become free. Right. So instead of saying, busy waiting, my protocol could be to delay <coughs> processing that message. So these things are uh, um, very simple constraints. And if you express them as constraints, uh, then you don't have to change the method itself. <coughs> so what you're doing here is separating how something is done from when it's done. So in uh, object-oriented programming, you learn how to separate the interface from the representation. So you say what is being done in the interface and how it's being done in the representation. But if we uh, just have that, then when something is being done, it doesn't do me any good to say this is what it does. This is what a get does. Because I don't know if a get will happen. A get will only happen thing doesn't have a fixed type. The type is actually changing. A get is now available, the put is now available, the get and put is now available. Right? So, yeah. So, so well, is the constraint that you have something which is local only, or can it also depend on the state of other actors? Right. So, um, so local synchronization constraints are local, and your question is exactly right, because the next thing we go to are these more global constraints. And so then you have multi-party constraints of atomicity or disabling or I'll get into sort of more complexity there. Right? I mean, here a local constraint, if you're just delaying, would be sufficient. So this, this is sort of a, a kind of a two-party contract where you could, at one end, take care of it. 
So, and then there are different semantics. You could drop the message, you could disable, you could reject, you could uh, throw exceptions, and so on. And different languages then fall into a different cluster on how to deal with uh, things that are out of order. But yeah, so here's an example of two party where you couldn't deal with it locally. So this is a, uh, a sliding window protocol. So take, take n equal to three, you can have up to three messages that are sent, but once, until they're processed, until they're acknowledged, you cannot send more messages. And of course, it could be well behaved or things could intersect each other. If you just look at the sliding window protocol for three, that's the automata that's representing the transitions on the states. And this will blow up very fast. So uh, some languages, for example, used finite state automata to enforce these protocols. And even in the case of, sort of two-party protocols, this becomes too complicated. Right? So what we want to do is to separate uh, these properties <coughs> for progress and uh, what, what is required and what is being um, uh, produced the session fidelity, we want to separate the session fidelity from the representation of the behavior itself. We don't want to encode the communication patterns into how things are being done. So that goes back to programmer intent. So one method then is uh, something called multi-party session types that we worked on. And these are sort of parameterized multi-party session types. The basic idea of a, a multi-party session type here is that you have a global type. So the global type is going to say something about the, the entire behavior, and I'll show you an example of what that means. And then you project it to the local type. And then the second part of it is to, to type inference on the local type. And then you can sort of compare these two and make sure the local types are correct. So at least you know that uh, things are projected and they will plug together. So here's an example, something called system A. So this says that the uh, uh, that these two things should be in sequence, and that's in parallel. So then these are the possible shuffles but that there is your type specification that these two things two things should be sequenced, and they may be uh, in this case you know A is sending something to B and then B sends to C, and now you can locally sort of verify that kind of behavior. Um, here's a different example. This says that. Uh, that this, uh, the, the, these two things have to be atomic with, with that. So now the order of these, A goes to B and B goes to C, has to be atomic, and this cannot come in, in the middle of the two. So A goes to D has, either has to be before the two or after the two. So there's a sliding window protocol, uh, which you can express in terms of these types. And of course, it could be out of order, especially when you scale up to multi-parties easier to show examples of just two parties. Um, these, these are sort of rather difficult for programmers to express, so we still argue for using constraints, and here's a work on synchronizers, it was the old work that this is providing a formalism for. Uh, so you basically, for example, the sliding window protocol, you would uh, have a state of the protocol which has to do with uh, the last act and the last frame, and the size of the protocol, so it's a parameterized protocol, and then you disable um, sending of more messages un until the uh, something has been acknowledged. So you can think of this sort of as a membrane between the two that is observing, and it changes the behavior by changing the scheduling of these two actors. So it's talking to the schedulers, and it's taking care of the interaction, and so you're not changing the individual behaviors. And now you can sort of think of them as connectors. So you have got your Lego box. Instead of just having Legos fitting each other, now you have tools. So things can be more fluid and mobile. And you can have different sorts of connectors and guarantee that their connections work. So we're starting to scale up a, a, a little bit in terms of how these programs are being expressed. And our tools were reasoning about them. So let, let me uh, skip that, and then we've done work on sort of progress guarantees. You, I can refer you to the papers there. So um, again, back to this issue of trying to understand the behavior now, uh, I've sort of given you a kind of a specification view. We've also gone the other way and said, uh, can we figure out 
given an actor system, people are implementing these things, can we figure out how to um, diagnose the bugs? So some of that work goes into testing, and actually developing the tools for testing. But having done that, we said, can we also look at the legacy code, legacy actor code that's now sort of being developed without the benefit of these higher level structures? Right? So it's progress to my 1986 thesis, not to the work in the 90s in coordination and not to the work being done now. But can we look at this legacy code and figure out what the concurrency structure is? So this is sort of the, the idea of sort of trying to infer the behavioral model <coughs> from the code to look at this and say, can we abstract out this stuff? So uh, one example of this was work uh, that, uh, done by my collaborators Ian Mason and Carolyn Talcott, then at Stanford and at uh, uh, um, John Hopkins. So he, there was a specification diagrams, which is a formalization, rigorous, you can think of message sequence charts or UML diagrams which are sort of inform, relatively informal notations, and the well, message sequence charts have restrictions, they have some formalization. UML is, is it its own thing, but some aspects of the interaction diagrams in UML. Uh, so this kind of captures that notion, but it's very well formalized, and it was developed thinking of actors. And so they're, they're intuitive, they have formal underpinnings, <coughs> and they're expressive, and so we ask the question, so that, the, the, there are these diagrams. So we ask the question, given the code, can we figure out these diagrams? And of course these diagrams then will be, um, have a correspondence to the types that we just discussed and make it amenable to reasoning. So this thing is something that a programmer could see and understand the larger structure. So you could start with the diagrams and refine them, which is one direction. The other is sort of, given the program, you can figure out um, uh, what the uh, structure is that is getting represented and if something is missed. <coughs> so what the diagram has is sequencing, parallel execution, choice, skip. So uh, these things could be actor lines or they could be activities that are forking, going through various actors. Um, it depends on what the program wants to think of. And then there is a repetition message sending and message receive, and so on. So here's a simple example, uh, which I will skip, but it's basically ping pong actors, easy to understand with this uh, diagram. You start and then you have one actor sending a ping, the other sending a pong, until you get a stop, and then you're going to stop. So this thing could be repeated some number of times, <coughs> which is governed by a parameter. So now, given, given this uh, actor behavior, can we figure out this is what's happening? And then you know, present it to the programmer, and uh, in some cases we know this becomes obvious once this diagram that this case is missing what happens if this message goes here, or if it's dangling, or it wouldn't make progress. And so, so, uh, so here I won't get into the details, but basically what we did was to construct an abstract diagram which constructs all possible behaviors, so it's uh, uh, essentially looking at this uh, symbolic analysis between actors, so you get a temporal order, you figure out a message flow graph between the actors of what methods could potentially call which methods, and then uh, this, this of course gives you an over approximation, and then we have to figure out invariance. So you look at dynamic executions, infer things like uh, number of loop iterations. Of course, these are undecidable, but in many cases, we find we can infer our success rate in the benchmarks was about 80%. And in fact, it wasn't necessarily the loop iterations that's the problem, but uh, we didn't have heuristics for more than two-party interactions. But about 70% of the bugs are in two-party interactions, so it's already a big, um, big win. So removing false pos positives, uh, splitting this, these abstract actors, inferring temporal orders, and so on. We, so we're combining static and dynamic methods to achieve this. Yeah. So several years back, there was a lot of this work on abstract interpretation. Right, right. Is this connected? It sounds very 
uh, similar. I don't know. It, well, so that uh, abstract interpretation, um, well, in, in some sense, it's an abstract idea with the Galois connection. Here, you're doing symbolic execution. So you're looking at sort of the, uh, you know, it's, it's points to analysis, and it's looking at who's talking to, to which actor. The analysis yeah. of the interactions as opposed exactly. to the analysis. Right, and instead of abstracting and then, and so there is an abstraction going on here, and there is a connection, but it, it's extra, extracting sort of the interactions. over, yeah, interactions, so you over approximate, and then you look at executions to refine it, and say, okay, okay you know, this can't happen, or these many iterations will do it. So, so while I'm there, I have one more question. Sure. So, um, I never came with questions. No, that's, fine. that's good. Um, so, the, the interesting part of it that is that we are separating the behavior of what a program is doing from the interactions. Right. But to some extent, its effective execution depends on its mapping to, like you said, schedulers and scheduling yeah, exactly. mechanisms. Yeah. Which means that the runtimes that are developed for these languages have to be correct. Yeah, have to be more sophisticated, exactly, right, yeah. So the... Yeah, but then, you know, that's sort of once for all you can prove their correctness. It's not every program. That not every program. And here we have sort of gone in the reverse, that your know, people have developed a bunch of actors, they had maybe something in mind, maybe they didn't formalize it, maybe they formalized it, if they formalized it, you can compare it to what you're inferring, and if they didn't, then you give them a picture saying, you know, this is what the interaction space looks like right now. So this is sort of going on the, the inference side. And of course, then there is the formalisms that, that relate to that. So uh, so I won't get into the details of it, but here's an example. So he, this ping pong example, you can see so there's, there's, there's a start, there's the ping messages that go, and then um, you know you start uh, ping, the ping message from there, it causes a pong message, and you keep bouncing until eventually there, there is a stop message that, that comes from this uh, place in the uh, in, in the ping actor, and then when that comes, then this thing is going to stop. So this is sort of the graph that's inferred from the computation, and then the uh, challenge is to figure out uh, the invariant, the the n. So so in fact, this is what we infer here which is equivalent to the diagram. There's an extra ping message here. Uh, so you go pong ping, but this is an equivalent diagram to the original diagram. Right. The star indicates the end? The star indicates that it's looping. And now you get to the problem of invariant detection. Where is the, uh, this is the invariant, <coughs> and now what is the parameter n? Is this limited? How does the stop pick? So that requires the dynamic analysis, and we actually succeed in figuring out the n from the dynamic <coughs> part. So we get this diagram out of the static part, the static analysis, and then we get the invariance from um, relationships between these traces from inferring. <coughs> so we generate hypothesis on this, and then we test the hypothesis, instrument the program, so see the details. So the refinement process is still ad hoc, and people will come up with more heuristics. Of course, it's because it's an undecidable problem. It's a good problem to work on, because you can come up with lots of heuristics that work. And um, it's actually a good way to get citation impact. Never solve a problem. Create more problems. <laughs> <to> solve one. <laughs> so if you just solve the problem and don't leave anything for anybody to do, then and these um, NP complete problems, NP hard problems, and, um, and impossibility problems are very good because in practice you can get get there ninety eight percent, ninety nine percent. So if you create one that's very useful, then people go. So the Concolic testing paper, for example, now has fifteen hundred different uh, citations because people have worked on solvers and implementing it in a different language and so on. And of course, there's no end to the solvers because in the end, it's unsolvable, and every solver will do something. So, um, anyway, so that, that's uh, so anyway, so there uh, the, the refinement of x equal to n we are actually in this case, and we can you know and people can pick methods that are being developed, sometimes even in sequential computing and apply them. 
we are able to infer about 78% uh, of, the, of the stuff. All right, so let me uh, go to two other topics. So, so we've got this sort of inferencing engines, testing engines, and you can't model check the universe. So there are parts of the program where you will uh, say, okay, um, can, what can I verify at runtime? I have the system running, and uh, can I uh, realize there's a problem? And I'm going to do one better than that. Based on what I'm observing, can I predict there might be a problem? Not predict every single problem, but predict there might be a problem that I haven't seen. That in a second. So here's a simple example. I have a property that actor A requests a certain value from B. B computes the value, sends it back to A. And my property is that you know no actor receives a value from another actor to which it has not sent a request. So how do I monitor this property? Well, I have an open system. I've got these millions of actors floating around. I can't just have something go to a central observer. That would be a big bottleneck. So I have to take this property, and I have to decentralize it. So I'm going to have this property expressed with respect to the processes in the actor. And every actor can check their local property and make observations. So this uh, decentralizes the knowledge, and actually I'm using the knowledge in a technical sense here, which I'll explain in a second, but won't get into too much detail. But essentially, uh, facts are facts only known to some observer. If a tree falls in a forest and there's nobody to hear it and there's no impact, nobody can infer it, then whether it fell or not fell is not an observable property. So the only thing that matters is something that has an effect. And only when an observation is made can I say that there's a violation. So this actually is related to the notion of knowledge logics or epistemic logics, which are facts are not facts, they're not meaningful. You have to say, who knows the fact? Somebody knows the fact. That implies the fact, but if the agent doesn't know it, then <coughs> it's not relevant. Knowledge is updated by communication. The point of communication is to update the knowledge. So what we do is to attach this knowledge to outgoing messages. So if you know what you're trying, looking for, you have some specification, different problem. Uh, then you say, OK, uh, what do I, what, who would know this, and where do I attach it? And we've automated that process of figuring out where to attach it. And in the end, uh, the sub-formulas are just bits, so it's very efficient. It's actually. Uh, then the property can be checked against your no local knowledge as the computation is proceeding. So it's based on epistemic logics and the uh, notion of knowledge vector, which is a vector of, um, uh, well, in, in this case, just relevant to the formula. There's a lot of sort of technical machinery there between vector clocks and epistemic logics and our entries of formulas attached with timestamps. That would be a whole, whole lecture to get into, but I'll, I'll show you an example. So you get this prop uh, propositional logics that you're familiar with, temporal logics, which just says uh, something was true in, in the step previously, something is always true, something is eventually true, something is true since something, so you're always looking in the past. That's the nature of monitoring and the runtime verification. And then you might have functions. The main thing is that at j, some formula is known. That's the new addition. So let's, uh, let's skip this uh, Greek. So like this property here, the value is computed. And then, uh, you know, so at this point, um, you have this formula that says that the, if the value is received, then b knows that in the, in sometime in the past, the value was computed. And A knows, so B knows that A knows that sometime in the past the value is requested. So the formula has to be who knows it. So this is the formula, and uh, we want to verify. So here the value has been requested, and now uh, B knows when the message is sent, when this request is sent, B knows that A knows that sometime in the past the value is requested. And then uh, it's computed, and uh, so that becomes the formula, and now B knows that sometime in the past it was computed, and that A sometime in the past of that past had requested it. And so when the value is received, we send this formula along, and the property can be verified. So this is the notion of distributed monitoring. Right? 
And there are various examples, and I run out of time, so let me get to predictive monitoring. Um, so in real life, when you, let's say you're crossing the road, and you have a safety property not to be hit by a truck, you make it across, and then a truck goes by, maybe two seconds later. You're going to be very nervous and say, was there something wrong with my protocol? Now, if I'm doing runtime verification, which is sort of the analog of testing, this depends on when you're doing it, um, it's just going to check because I wasn't run over by a truck. But in real life, I would ask, was there something preventing this truck from going? Was there a, a safety margin? If there was a semaphore, a walk sign, and there was enough time to cross or something, okay, the light just turned green, fine. If there was no light, then <laughs> this causality could have been reversed. So what we want to do is to learn from violations that did not occur in a run, but could have occurred. Uh, so this notion is an example. Um, uh, so uh, here's, a, here's a formula that says always the value of y is greater than the value of x at, at 1, and at p2 this is, this is true. So y is some variable at p2, and x is some variable at p1 in the internal state. So here x uh, communicates the value that when the value is 6, uh, the clock is advanced to 1, it's local clock and then the value becomes 4, and it communicates the value 4 to P3, and now P3 knows that at time 2 of process 1, it was 4, and then it communicates this to P2, and it, Y becomes 5 at P2, um, now it's 2, and so the formula checks. Right? And when this message arrives that the value was 6, it's not going to update the knowledge state, because uh, this state has to do with time one, the state has to do with time two, so it's an old state to be ignored. Right? So the formula is still true. <coughs> However, um, because you have this arrival order non-determinism, it's possible that this message would have arrived before that message. In which case, uh, there would be a violation. So even though you didn't observe the violation, because you're tracking these vector clocks, you can predict the violation. <coughs> by a local shuffle. You say, ah, this message, if I have the entire clock, I haven't shown you the entire clock, but if, if I have the causal chain, which can be very efficiently encoded with respect to the, basically depending on the length of the formula, I can say, ah, but this could have happened. And in a subsequent run, <coughs> something could be wrong. So this is the notion of predictive uh, monitoring. So you can think of the causal cone. It's not the complete universe but you're sort of looking in the neighborhood of these things. All right, so you then have look much wider horizon. Now we can sort of go to aggregate properties. Uh, when you scale up, you might be wanting to do monitoring across large numbers. This gets into a notion of statistical monitoring. So the last topic for a couple of minutes, but you have uh, to give them a word maybe. Yeah. Um Peace. For those of you who are waiting for the word of the day, it's called one, it's wonderful, all in small letters. Okay, uh, so I'm going to take five more minutes, that's okay, um, and get into sort of this notion of statistical model checking. So here, for example, you, know, you, you often get these things like, uh, oh, they, they got every single um, account, information on every single account. And you wonder, okay, you know, what sort of monitor allows this volume? Now, you can't be checking every single node, but if you were sampling, you could figure out, for example, that too much data is going through. So in this case, you're looking at some kind of an aggregate property. An individual thing may not flag a violation, but the aggregate flags a violation. So this kind of notion of statistical checking. So, uh, you know, simulations have been done for a very long time. The question was, can we do formal verification based on simulations or based on real data, as you will? <coughs> and so we developed this notion of statistical model checking, which has become big. In fact, uh, Ed Clark I had lunch with, and he was trying to model check biological systems, and the thing was exploding on him. And I suggested statistical model checking, and actually he applied it to the biological 
systems that he was collaborating with. The idea of statistical model checking is to combine logical specifications with statistical methods. So we did the first uh, paper, this case event, uh, event simulation. The term statistical model checking was defined in my, in my group. Uh, you have assumed no control, so we did black box testing. It could be Markov chains and things of that sort uh, for the execution of the system. You define the logic, the usual exercise. Here you have bounded until, but we worked on fairness. Uh, probability the message would be received within 200 time units without retransmission is greater than 0.98 and so on. And I won't have time to get into lots of details like what you do for black swan events. You need a little bit of white box testing there. You force it to places where there might be a problem. So there are methods of dealing with that. The basic idea is you have a model or uh, implementation. You have a model checker which basically is going to um, take the specification that you're going to feed the specification to, and it's going to answer yes, no, or it cannot say. So you feed the property to the model checker. So you decouple uh, the executions, the simulation, or the model of the implementations runs from the, from the checking. What you're going to work on is the traces. Um, so you know, for example, you have 30 paths. You have a property that p unto 12 to units q is uh, um, point, point greater than 0.6. <coughs> so can we say the probability is greater than 0.6 that p holds and q holds? So statistically, we need to then quantify the decision. We use statistical methods. In this case, it's a binomial distribution, and you can get error. Complexities come in when you have. Um, uh, so in this case, you've got sort of a binary decision based on the probability that you want <coughs> of your confidence. Um, you can definitely answer yes or no. When you have nested formulas, you also have the possibility of don't know, because you don't know how to resolve the nesting with respect to the formula. So things get more complicated. Um, I will um, proceed. Uh, there's a modified decision procedure I won't get into. So, so that's that's a basic notion of statistical model checking, which starts to um, scale things up. Now, one thing, one last comment I'll make before so future work slide, last two slides. Um, a different method for reasoning that we developed, that I alluded to, the gradient model checking, we treat the state in a in a different manner. So usually what we're doing in all these systems, the state of a system is the cross product of the individual states of, of the elements in the system. But now suppose I have my sensor network on the bridge that I talked about at the beginning. I have these uh, hundreds of nodes, and I want to know the energy consumption or the throughput or the reliability of the system as a whole. There's a lot of sort of uh, identical behavior, identically distributed behavior. If I take the cross product and I even abstract the states to five states, it's dead, it's hibernating, it's communicating, it's sensing, I get five to the hundred states. There's no way to model check that. Now, this is very similar to, you know, what do you do with the state? Um, so, in quantum computing, what we do is treat the state as a probabilistic superposition of the individual states the elements could be in. So instead of taking the cross product, I put in the vector, what is the probability of being in state one? What's the probability of being in state two? What's the probability of being in state three? And then we develop methods for studying the evolution of the probability distribution, expressing uh, to develop our own logic, variation on linear temporal logic with quantitative elements and then basically reduces the problem to um, doing linear algebra, because we are in equilibrium space with these linear probability distributions. You associate a reward function with each state, and you can figure out the aggregate behaviors. So that's a new method uh, for model checking these systems that we developed. OK, so uh, concurrent programming needs to, you know, needs abstractions. I've talked about some abstractions. I didn't get into sort of probabilistic programming, which is in continuous variables, which is an interesting aspect. I've done some work on. When you get to these big data applications, scalability and approximations will be key. 
So you have some probabilities that you're after, which ties to the simulation methods and ties to the statistical model checking. Um, and you, you're trying to get into it in some amount of time. You've done some work on sort of the energy complexity of these things. In fact, you define an energy complexity metric that um, I won't get into right now. But I think uh, the future is adaptive programming, where systems are predicting what's going to happen, avoiding pitfalls, looking at statistical sampling, and continually optimizing. And they have to sort of deal with the aggregates and deal with these variables and create interactions. These interaction protocols can be dynamically created to satisfy properties. And so you can have more goal-oriented programming and bring the eye to bear in various ways into the programming, which is where this whole enterprise actually started. <laughs> This kind of symbolic programming. So I think we've come back in a full circle and we can bring a lot, a lot of things to bear this problem. I'll stop you now. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions. So anybody specifically want to ask? Because I have one. So um, you know the concept of reflection. Right. Came out in, and you know, computational reflection came out in the programming language world. Right. And it seems like with this kind of predictive uh, programming, mm -hmm. uh, are we coming back to looking at reflection as a methodology for supporting this kind of programming? Yeah, I think definitely. Uh, so, so the notion of reflection is, is very important. It basically uh, says that the actor itself has uh, this, the system itself is a system of actors. It's doing the communication, it's doing the scheduling, and so on. And the actor is interacting with these. And so the notion of computational reflection is that I can modify some of my schedulers, I can modify some of my protocols. So the actor, if it has a specification, can then install this into the system and, and adapt. So, yeah. So, I, maybe I missed your point, sure. but it appears to me adaptive, adaptive computing has largely been used, as far as I'm aware of, in the context of performance, in the right. optimization and performance. Yeah. I think what you alluded to at part was safety and about uh, right. other aspects. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Which is very different in compared to, let's say, previous. Right, right, right. right. Now, yeah, it's much more AI-ish than just yes. sort of uh, optimizing a parameter, which, you know, also happens in AI, but... Um, it, it, it's very much adaptation in the sense of, you know, here's my specification, here's an error that could have happened, and therefore I will in install this constraint and prevent this error. So, so I, do have, yeah, no, I do have a question for you. Yeah. So, it appears to me that if we were to adopt this model, and I, I guess you don't have, like, I, I, the question you didn't want, you already answered 15 years ago, right? Like, it's practical. <laughs> so I, that's okay. But I, let me ask that anyway. Right? Right. So, the question is, the, the challenge of specifications itself, the, you cannot reason with these systems at all unless there is specification. How complicated is it for programmers to come with specifications? Yeah, so the specifications get more and more abstract. But because I think, yeah. The, so the, the, without the abstraction, I mean, so if you, if you just look at sort of board logic or something and say, okay, give me a specification, that's not going to work because you have all these interactions. But take a specification like a constraint. The constraint says something probabilistic, something aggregate, some protocol interaction. That constraint is quite, I mean, think of there's a constraint on inflation. So the Fed is trying to manage this. It's a very simple constraint. The implementation is very complicated, but it's a very simple constraint. So the specifications can be relatively simple. The problem is translating these specifications which means the specifications have to be rich enough and studied enough not for forcing the programmer to do something that's impossible, which is to you know, specify every single interaction. There must be a way of specifying these interactions, but then you need ways of specifying global properties in more abstract languages and constraint languages and language of probabilities. And I don't think there'll be just a single abstraction you have to sort of have multiple abstractions that programmers are comfortable with and translate them into these knobs, the problems of the reflection. So, 
so yeah. So I think you know specifications have gotten a bad name because it's basically writing in a more obscure notation what's already there <laughs> in the program. It is hard. <laughs> right. And then and, and that's hard. But if you take constraint like specification, it's easy. If you take the specification diagram, you can sort of see this and say, ah, I need an arrow here. Or here's a dangling arrow, what do you want to do about this? So the issue with the, you know, using specifications is at the end of the day, your system is only as good as your specification. Right, right. But you can infer specifications. You can infer, here's a disaster. Can I get to it? Right. And so you can sort of create the specification from the program itself. So at least cases. what is the right. key properties that you <coughs> Yeah. And then the second part is that the specification is abstract enough. Then you know, then you're going from this global type, which the program understands as some idea of, to the local. If you're just giving a bunch of local things, then there can be many more bugs in it. So you, you sort of need the specifications to become more powerful and your translation tools to become more powerful. Yeah? So, so you have a specification. That's something that we wanted. Um, but you know, you describe the assumptions for hitting assumptions. That, for instance, you know, we take things for granted for saying you have to, uh, for semaphore, you have to lock and use an unlock, mm -hmm. right? So you have this assumption that it's supposed to be this way. Right. And, uh, but that's something now we can infer, right? Okay. We can look at a program and infer that this is what it's doing. And yeah, then the so programmer can look at that and say, wait a minute. Is that what I want? Is that what I want? Especially when it comes to interaction. So those things are simple enough. It's like the local type. It's these interactions where the complexity is, and you want to give them a picture. Okay, so now I'm dealing with the things that are specified, and the things are not uh, uh, unspecified, which can be very dangerous, because right. it's like hidden in people's mind. Yeah, so this is where the elucidating and the diagrams and bring a formalism and predicting violations that haven't occurred, all of these techniques are okay. getting to this problem. So thank you very much, Chris. Oh, there's one more question. Sorry. 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 So, for example, if you're looking at a median, then if the Byzantine is, fork is giving you a value, that value can be can um, make a very small difference. If you're looking at the mean, then of course it can be a disaster. Right? So it, it becomes back to sort of level of protocols and reasoning methods that are more non-parametric, more behavior, and it becomes it becomes a problem. Of that sort of analysis. And we have faced that, where it's not uh, Byzantine on purpose, but for example, the, the echo, like you're trying to localize things, and the echo is stronger than the original signal. Uh, yeah, yeah so, but that fault is the scenario of the blockchain application, so and it's very popular nowadays. Uh -huh. yeah. Right, right, yeah. So, yeah, but you, know, you have to sort of use appropriate tools uh, yeah. to deal with that. So some of this probabilistic verification, if I recall, was used in verifying some of the security protocols and security protocols. Right, right. And we've done it. Uh, we've also applied it to denial of service attacks. I don't know that it's been applied in the blockchain setting, but perhaps. Well, runtime verification is being applied now to the Ethereum. Thank you so much.